All right, there we go. We're we're live. All right, um, I'm just gonna do a basic tool handle today and show you a, a few different tools and for using the using the same thing. So I'm gonna start out and I'm gonna rough it out and I'm gonna use three different tools. I'm gonna use a roughing gouge, a skew chisel, and then the carbide cutter. So they they all do do the same thing. You can do a variety of things with these, but just to rough it out. The, they'll all rough a piece out. So I'm just going to show you that real quick. Um, if you have any questions along the way, just go ahead and ask them if uh, you want to type them in or if uh, if you're live on live on the show. All right, so what I have here is just a blank of maple, and I need to make a handle for my file. Though this is the file I use to clean up my tool rest and keep it, keep it smooth and nick-free. But I don't have a handle for it, so I'm just going to make a little handle. I have I made a little ferrule for it for out of just a piece of copper pipe. So I'm going to put that on the end of it to keep it from cracking. And hey, Sterling, how you doing? Doing well. How are you? I'm doing good. Welcome to the show. All right. Um, so. If you have any questions before I get started, I've, this is just a basic project, and I can turn a little bit and then come back. Or if you have any questions before we get going, I can answer. Right, let's see. Let's see what's going on, and I'll, I'll ask as we go. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and switch cameras here. To where to go? We're going to switch to the lathe. All right. Okay, and lighting's okay over here and everything? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. What? Okay, all right. So I'm just going to use the spur center here. I went ahead and, and uh, uh, mark center on each end. Go ahead and put it in here. Lock this down. Get it in. All right. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start out with the roughing gouge. I'm gonna have the tool rest just below center, center a little bit. That way, with the roughing gouge here, you want to have the tool handle down. So that you can ride the ride the bevel on that. So let me go ahead and put my face mask on, and I'll just do a little bit of on with this, and then I'll switch to the skew, and then do the carbide cutter. You can see how all those work. Mm -hmm. And I have the lane speed at. Uh, I'm going to run it at about a thousand. About Basically, just clean knots off the corners here. Okay, I'm going to switch to a skew chisel, and for that, I need to raise the tool rest up to about center. Carl, what determines the speed that you want to use to turn on? Okay, so it there is there is a calculation for if you're having um, for the diameter of the bowl to the speed, but it also it completely depends on the piece of wood. If there's a crack in it, you can't go by by that. It's it. I would I would def check over the piece of wood, and if you know it's a 10 inch bowl and it says to turn it at 1200 RPMs and it has a crack in it, I wouldn't do that. So 
you just need to inspect the piece of wood before you adjust that. I normally run something small like this. I can turn this up even more, and I'll probably turn it up a little bit because it's not cutting real clean. But something like this, you can turn it up to 1,500 or something as long as it's a solid piece of wood, even to start out with. It's not going to not gonna hurt it. The slower it's going, especially when you're using the skew like this, the more chance you are to catch one of these corners. So if it's going faster, you're you're going to be hitting these hitting the high spots uh, quicker. It's because they're going to be coming at you faster. So I'll turn it up to about 1500 on the skew, and I'll show you that. You guys, can you see okay? Is what I'm doing? Yes. Yep. So oh. um, again, what what wood are you using? Uh, this is maple. Maple. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Let's go ahead and and I'll do the. Basically, knock the corners off with the skew chisel. That gets a really nice cut too. The skew is is probably one of the best tools for getting a clean cut, and but it's a little tricky. It's it's the skew takes some practice to learn how to use. You don't want to hit the the point there or the heel. It, it'll catch and run right back up up the piece and leave a big old gouge in it. So it takes some practice, but once you learn how to use it, it's a it's a great tool and and makes a nice clean cut. All right, I'll take a little more off with the skew and then I'll switch to the carbide cut. So, like I said, the, the skew is one of the one of the harder tools to learn how to use. You want to keep that cutting edge right in the middle, as close to the middle as you can. Once it it starts to skip up and, and hits that point, it's it's a mess and it turns turns into a mess fast. Even the heel will catch and, and run back up. So that one, just practice with some small stuff like this, and once you get it down, though, it's it's a great tool. All right, now let's switch to the carbide cutter. And these these are great for beginning wood turners. They're easy to use. All you do is set it up on center here. Grab that. They actually make little little levels for these two, to where you you mount the level on on the tool, and then that way it it's level when you're cutting. And if you're going to use these a lot, they actually have spacers for different lays. And you just drop a spacer in there, and that way it's always on center with your headstock and tailstock. All right. And same thing on this. Um, basically, just set it up like that, and I'll show you how well, well these cut. And I'm just going to run it at 1,500 again. I got a couple little spots in there that are, are coming up. Well, I start shaping it. 
All right. Do we have any any questions about that? I can switch. All right. Anybody have any questions about the, those tools or speed or anything? I think Ron. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. I'm sorry. I was, I was reading a question. <laughs> All right. Rendered ones. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make my the piece for the ferrule here. So I need a set of calipers. What did he want? What size are you on mine? Oh. I don't know how many you can see them. And Craig wants to know what size skew, one inch? Uh, the skew chisel is, hang on, I'm sorry, I'm answering questions too. It's inch and a quarter. <laughs> the skew chisel is inch and a quarter. Carl, is your calipers rounded over on the ends? Yeah. You round, round these over just with a little bit of sandpaper, and it's probably not best to, to hold them against the wood while it's turning. It's a little bit unsafe, but but if the corners are rounded over, it will prevent them from, from catching, and, you know, I, I don't think it's recommended to, to use them while the lay is running, but if they're rounded over, it's, it's pretty safe. So, yeah, definitely definitely round those over if you're using them for the, for the lay. All right, so what I'm going to do here is bring down this part right here to fit that the ferrule. So come in, and then I'm going to use a parting tool for that. And where'd it go? I know I'm supposed to be all set up, right? All right, so I'm just going to bring that down to diameter. And so with the parting tool, I'll come back over. Okay, so same, th same thing with traditional tools, you want to ride the bevel. So you want to come in, don't just take the parting tool and, and stick it straight in. Bring it up, ride the bevel, and it's, as you go in, work your way down. And because your diameter is going to be getting smaller, you actually need to bring the tool up to keep that bevel against it. So there's, you can do do this with a couple different tools. You can use a skew on its side to do the same thing. Mine's my skew is has a little bit of an arc to it, a curve to it, so it's not great for stuff like this. They do make flat skews, and those those work well for that. And or you can use a carbide cutter that's square. I'll bring it down with the carbide the rest of the way, and basically the same thing. And I think I'm a little bit high. Really close, and if I need to get it get it any closer, I'll just just sand it so I don't take off too much material. All right, 
So I'm going to go ahead and start shaping it. With uh, When you're putting these little ferrules onto, it's a good idea to, once you get them on, uh, put a little indentation in them. You know, use some uh, Gorilla Glue or something that bonds to steel, but put a little in and, you know, tap them with a, with a nail punch or something to make sure they stay on. All right, I'm going to go ahead and start shaping it, and while I'm doing that, getting a couple of tools ready. Guys, have any questions so far? I can't see where I'm at. Carl, uh, yeah. your cutting edge, uh, your cutting edge on the skew chisel is straight. No, this one is is uh, is curved like oh, that. No. Can you, can you see that? Uh, actually, that it's too many pixels. Yeah, it's got a bit of an arc to it, and it's it's just personal preference. They uh, uh, yeah. there's a there's a straight one there, and. Oh, yeah. I just got, when I start turning, uh, I for the beginner. Uh, tell me, for the beginner is better. Pardon me. Around. for the beginner. Um, you know what? It I think it just comes down to to what you're comfortable with. I've used both of them. They all cut nice. I just I got used to do using the curved one. They even have oval ones. But I you know I get a nice clean cut with the with the this one, so I just kind of stuck with it. So it's it just you, you can learn how to use any of them and, and get a clean cut with them. So it's not uh, not something that's the straight ones cut better or or, or than the curved ones. It just just depends on what you what you uh, are comfortable with. All right, I'm going to switch to a couple different tools here. For shaping this. All right, so here's a here's an old tool handle I had. So I'm basically just going to do do the same thing. Just give it bas that basic shape. So, all right, let's uh, switch back, and then I'll show you. I'm gonna. I have a spindle gouge here. This is a three eighth spindle gouge, and then I have a round carbide cutter for shaping that. Switch back. Any more questions before I get started? Right. Okay. So what I'm going to do is just try and watch, watch this as close as I can, and then I'll show you how to put in some detail lines in there too. And I'm going to turn the lay speed up to about 2,000. So that's spindle gouge, and when you're when you're using that, just uh, can you kind of see? Just hold it hold it against your body. You don't need a whole lot of pressure on it, and move your body. But the, don't when you don't have it back here going like this. Just hold it hold it up there and move your whole body with it, and 
keep your legs spread apart. It's just you're more stable. You're not, you know, coming at it from an angle over here and jabbing at it. Just kind of, kind of try and flow with with the tool back and forth. It, it just makes it much smoother, and you get a smoother cut. All right, I'll come in and use the round cutter and kind of shape this a little bit, and I'll just kind of go back and forth. Bring it down a little bit more with this. Can you hear me? Yeah, Carl, we can hear you. Okay, I think there was a little bit of a problem. I had to mute somebody real quick. I'm not sure who, who I muted. All right. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and clean this up. I'll use a skew to clean it up a little bit. So now I'm gonna switch and do some some little detail work on it. I'm gonna put, like you can see on the handles here, they put these little grooves in it and burn some lines. So that's basically I'll show you how to do that real quick. These ones that were on on the old handle, they aren't burnt, but they're just little little detail grooves in it. So and then, all right. There's two ways two ways to do this. Well, there's probably several different ways to do it, but I'll show you how to burn burn the lines in. 
So you want to take your take a skew or the corner of a parting tool or something. And just touch it on the piece. Like that. And then have, have this wire with a couple of handles on it. Just hold it up there. I'll start to smoke. I'll show you that up close when it, when I'm done here. But um, okay, so I'm going to do a couple more. And there's use a little detail tool. You can do the basically the same thing, or you can put in little beads. So I'll show you that real quick. There's a little detail tool. We'll just burn those two. All right. And generally, when I'm doing little detail stuff like this, I I usually sand it up into I don't know maybe maybe. Uh, 200 or something, and then put in those lines so you don't sand them all away. And that just it makes it easier, and that way you don't have to go in so far. But it, it adds a nice little touch to it. All right, so sanding this piece. And this is, I use, I sand with oil a lot, so you don't have to. You can put in, um, uh, if you want to put a shiny finish on it, don't use the vinyl oil and wax. You want to use a polyurethane or something, just dry sand it. So I just like using the, the oil because of the dust. So it doesn't fill the shop up with dust. And that's basically my, my, you know, number one reason why I use it. And I just, I like a satin finish too. So you know, it's just uh, it's a win-win for me. But if you want a shiny finish, just dry sand it and use uh, use something else like a polyurethane or something. All right, so I'll just dry sand a little bit of it just to kind of kind of show you. So I always turn the lay speed down to probably below 300. I probably keep it around 200 or so, and that's because if you if you're sanding it fast, you're not really you're not really hitting it. It's just going way too, way too fast, and you're just barely touching the surface of it. You slow it down, sand it, and what I always do is I sand. I usually go back and forth with the grit. So start out at 180, and then I'll switch to 200 or to uh, yeah, to 220. And then go back, reverse the lathe. So, did you, I'm not sure if you can see that. There you go. Can you see that? I always go back and forth. And the reason is, if you just sand in one direction, you're you're laying the laying the grain down all all one way. So it just continuously laying the grain down in one direction. So if you reverse it, it lays it down one way and then pulls it back up and sands it off the other way. And I just go back and forth all the way up through through 600 that way. So just get it like that. I'm just doing it with 100 or with 180, but I was gonna. I'll finish this after we're done here. Just go back and forth like that. You don't need to run. Run it up. This is, you know, too high. This is the tool handle, but it makes a nice clean cut. I was talking to Mike the other day too, and he said that he uh, he actually stops the lathe and runs the grain direction too, and that gets a nice, nice clean finish. I I haven't tried that before, but I might might give that a try. So the other thing is, most important thing is when you're done sanding with the piece of sandpaper. That's it. 
it's don't say it. this isn't 180 anymore. We never just, uh -huh. so, just just uh, throw it away because it's if you try and reuse this and come back to it, it's not not the same sandpaper. You just you think it is on the back, so throw it away. It's you know cause you more problems than than you think. Even you think you're saving money, but you sand with this and then try and get the scratches out from 150 with this again, it'll take you forever or it won't ever get them out. So just, just pitch it when you're done. All right, I'll sand up a little bit dry and then uh, and then I'll show you with the oil on it. So run this over here real quick. Get it cleaned up. And the other thing is try and keep even pressure on it. Don't uh, don't come in with with your first grit and just grind on it, and then the next grit, you know, real light pressure or something. Just try and keep even pressure through through all the grits. That way you're not not scratching it more. Probably don't, don't want to see me stand this whole thing, right? Alright. And the other thing is when you switch grit, so you go from from 220 to 320 or whatever, inspect the piece and make sure that it's that it doesn't have scratches when you're done. So if it has 180 scratches in it when you're done with the 220, they're they're going to be there. You're not going to be able to get them out with 400. So make sure as you go that you're getting the scratches out from the stamp paper behind. So if you, uh, as long as the the piece is clean of tear outs and stuff when you start sanding, all you're doing is sanding out the scratches from the from the grit before. That's that's all this is doing. So so just keep keep working. All right. Hang on one sec. How long does the wax finish last before you have to do it? Oh, all right. Somebody had a question question on there about the wax finish. So it the wax needs to be reapplied. So you can't. Um, it's not like a polyurethane where it's going to last last forever. But all you have to do is wipe on a, a thin coat and polish it up with a clean rag, and and then it's it's good again. I had a question about the the sun I did. On Friday for Friday's project, and why I didn't use wax is because all of the little curves in it, if you fill that with wax, it's going to turn white, and it's going to be a pain to get all that out. So I just put a coat of uh, uh, salable oil on it, and then that way you don't have to worry worry about it. It gives it a nice sheen, and the wax won't dry down in those cracks. Okay. Nope. Can you buff the sanding finish once it's dry? Buff the Wax? Yes. After you, after you sanded it, was it okay? Yeah. Uh, so you can buff the wax up again after, you, after you're all done sanding it. Too. So you can just buff it up, but it will, sitting on a shelf, it's going to dry out. That wax is going to dry out, so you do need to reapply it. And, you know, I mean, it doesn't take, uh, take very long to do it, just you know, a minute or two to put a little bit of wax on a clean cloth and, and buff it, buff it right back up. It would be nice. Again. Do you only use cloth sandpaper? Yeah. And another question. Yes, I only use cloth sandpaper, and uh, when I'm turning, and I started using it because I was sanding with the oil, and it it holds up. Um, I just there's probably some good quality paper out there, but this this stuff I use I get from Clingspore, and it's just it's a great quality paper, and uh, it holds up well in in the oil. All right. So I got one little spot there I want to get out real quick. Just as you're going, make sure that there's no little tear outs or anything. All right. Now I'm going to switch to the oil and, and show you that. And all it is 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 I put the I start putting the wax in. Uh, because it was getting spraying up and getting on the camera before, so that's why I started using that. But you can use just mineral oil, you can use walnut oil. Walnut oil um, 
they say it cures, so it's uh, it's a little bit better for it. But I'm not sure. The mineral oil dries. It's I've been using it for 20 years, and it it does actually dry. All right. So with the mineral oil, I just put a little bit on the sandpaper here. Turn the lay speed, make sure it's down so it doesn't splatter all over the place. I just dipping it in there and not sure if you could see before all the dust that was coming off and it was just sanding this little piece. But with this, it catches all of the the dust right there in the in the sand or in the oil. I do the same thing with this. I just put it on the piece. If it's a large piece, I'll take a uh, paper towel and dip it in the oil and wipe the whole thing down first. It's a little easier to get get started that way. I just do that. Same thing. I, I reverse the lay and hand it back the other way. And then I wipe off the excess, excess, excess wax in between each uh, each grid, just like that. And, uh, you can kind of see. I really, I just love the way the oil brings out the brings out the wood grain. All right. So that's basically all I do. I just keep going through the through the grips here, and I put new oil on it each time. I dip the sandpaper back in the in the oil as I'm going. And just try and, if you don't keep dipping it in there and it get it'll dry out and then it'll it uh, will just clog up the sandpaper. So that's why I just keep going back and forth. So you can see it, it just trap traps all the and it's not clogging up the sandpaper, it's still still nice and clean. All right, I'm just gonna gonna stop there. Pull that off there real quick and show you. But it's and that's just there's no wax or anything on it. That's just just the oil. It really brings out the the grain in the wood. Wow, looks nice. Okay. Yeah. Well, I still need to drill the. I'm gonna put the ferrule in and drill the hole for this, and finish it up. But that's basically, basically it. I just need to clean off the end here, but I'll do that off off the lathe. The ferrule here. Test that real quick. The other thing is, a lot of times I'll leave uh, uh, leave a tenon like this a little bit proud, because it I get the oil on it and the oil. Oil, the glue won't stick to the oil, so I leave them a little bit proud, and that way I can I can sand it back down to clean wood when I put the glue, whatever it is, together. So I do that a lot too, it's, because I know I'm going to sand with the oil. I just just keep that a little bit thick. Carl, determines the length of the handle that you want. I know most basic blade tools are nine, ten inches long on the handle, and I've seen some two feet long. What determines that length? Uh, it depends on what they're for. Let me switch back here real quick. So we have. I'll show you that. Uh, you okay there? All right. So yeah, it it completely depends on what you're doing. So this this tool here is a just small little detail tool. You're not going to be getting in there and, and trying to take out a lot of material with it just for doing little detail stuff so you don't need a, need a big handle for it same with uh, this little carbide cutter there it's, it's just for doing small stuff so you, you're not going to be hogging out a lot of wood but when you get into you know, larger things like like bowl guides when you're going to be cleaning out the inside of the bowl you, you want that leverage you want to want to be back from the back from the piece Give yourself some leverage too, because it's going to be, you know, hopping, trying to hop around on you. So 
that's why these bigger bigger cutters are are uh, have longer handles is because you're just going to be doing doing larger pieces and they they get this one here is like uh, and then these are for doing you know massive massive stuff so definitely for cleaning out the insides of bowls and stuff like that the more leverage you have the better it's it's going to be you want to keep your tool rest you know up as close as you can to the workpiece you know you need it back a little bit to have the tool rest on it but the more leverage you have out here the better and the smoother you're going to be able to cut and the safer it's going to be if you have have your workpiece you know out or your tool rest out here and you're jabbing at it in there it's it's going to be doing this you're going to be bouncing up and down and it's going to grab it and flip it out of your hand or it's just going to just you know, jab at the piece, and, and it, you're not going to get a clean cut. So even with with something like this, you want it right up against the workpiece. You want a little amount of hanging over the tool rest as possible, and just nice clean cut. So the only time like um, these big um, hollowing tools, this thing right here, probably weighs 30, 40 pounds. <laughs> I don't know, maybe maybe 15 or 20 but this thing is you're going to be inside that bowl you know 15 inches and there's no way to get that close to the tool rest so this thing I put underneath my arm and but this is like probably inch and in, inch stock so it's I mean it's not going to flex at all on you so something like this is why they're you know you're way down inside a base or something with this and it gives you a lot of leverage and that's that's basically it is depends on on what your what your journey. Um, I think that's that was it. Yeah, good, Sterling. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Did I answer your question? Uh, can you uh, can you turn a workpiece around, Jessup? Uh, like a bowl to finish it? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Uh, oh, Sterling. Uh, yeah, the um, about the reverse and lay. So, what type of lathe do you have? The hammer uh, Oh, Okay. They um. You might check the the um, the wiring diagram because some of them you can actually put a switch in. If you go online and do a search, I know I had a had an old Delta, and there's something they need to have on the inside the wiring diagram, but um, it'll show up on there. But I think you need to do do a search because there's an easy way to do it. You can put in a re uh, switch to reverse it, and, and it's pretty easy. I did it, you know. Just a couple of pieces of wire and a toggle switch. It works. Uh, uh, what, what do you mean? Can you turn your workpiece around? I, I think he was answering my question. If I didn't have reverse, you could just simply turn the piece around and sand it the other way. Oh, yeah, you could do that. Um, it kind of, it's going to be a bit of a pain flipping it back and forth but yeah you could actually just flop it you know that way and, and do the same thing but um, you know I mean if it's a box or, or a bowl or something it's, it would be a you know huge pain to do it you know a lot of times on the bowls I will um, I will put it on there and turn it and sand like the outside of it and then that way when you reverse it to take the foot off or something, it's actually going the other direction. So you're actually sanding the other direction the whole way, the whole time you're finishing the bottom of it. So that works too. Uh, oh, I've been turning about 20 years. I I can't see all the questions, so my wife's bringing bringing questions. All right. Um. All right. So any the ball is turning one way, or two, uh, or you you said uh, you're turning. You can also turn the other way around, but you 
you always turn one way because you have a um, constant grip that you are um, turning. In. Um, you call yeah, the work the workpiece has to be coming towards you. Is that what you you have to turn where the where the workpiece is spinning towards you to cut? Yeah. 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 Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no, yes, okay. I, yeah. I just um, yeah. I just use the reverse to to uh, sand. But, but you can go on the other side and if you're left-handed or something or you know I don't know. You can you can do it from either side. Okay. Yeah. If you're more comfortable over there. All right. All right. Anything else? Uh, I have sharpening jig. Um, I can show you. I think that. Um, hey, Carl, yeah. do, you, do you use a, a whetstone grinder to sharpen the tools or just normal grinder? I have. Hang on, let me flip it around here. Real quick. How's that? Can you see that all right? Okay, so I have a slow speed grinder. It's an 8 inch, and the max RPM are 1725 on it. So I have a diamond stone that I use just to touch everything up with. So this is, um, you don't want to shape your tools if you're trying to trying to get a grind with this. You want to do them on, on the rough wheel. This is, I think, I think 80 or 120. So if I'm trying to regrind something, I'll do it on this, and then you move over to, to the diamond stone just to get a, a nice finish on it. So I have a couple of jigs. One jig. This is a Wolverine sharpening system. It's really nice. It, you get a nice, consistent grind every time. So it's you just set it up and, and then don't have to worry about it. So let's see. So, so uh, roughly. Want to want to okay uh, okay uh, there it is all right so take a black sharpie color color your grind there and bring the tool up lay it down on there. And then just hand turn the, the stone until you get you can see that the sharpie's worn off all the way all the way down. And then that way you're not grinding away good steel. So you just keep moving this in and out until you until you find that spot and then and lock it down. And that way I got one second. Try and get it. Turn this on and do it faster, but okay. And you see that right, right there in the center, and, and that way you're not grinding away the good steel. And it just takes a second to do that, and it'll save you a, a bunch of money for sharp, sharper tools. Um, okay, so the other thing is it has a platform on it for doing your scrapers and skews. Same thing. You pull this out. Slide it right up there. You can lay your skews or, or uh, uh, scrapers on it. And it works great. And then it has this little jig here. And this is for doing bowl gouges, spindle gouges, same thing. So you take your skew chisel. I have a little mark on here. It's two inches. You want the tool sticking out two inches from the end of, the, end of this thing. Set it up. All right. And same thing. 
slide it up there until you get your bevel, and then you just rock it back and forth. Depending on on what you what you want. Your grind might here right here might be a little bit different. If you want to I pull the sides back way back on mine. So I move it in a little bit after I'm done getting the, the front grind on it. I move it in a little bit to get that side grind. So it just depends on what you're comfortable with. I I don't like the bowl gouges that are actually have them. I just have the so all right, so that's it. Uh, you know, I, I guess you'd call it traditional grind on a bowl gouge. It's super steep, and I've just never had good luck with them. It just, um, I get it catches all the time, um, and so I just stop using it, and it's, it's, uh, I just, I guess if I practice more, <laughs> I would get it down, but I can't do it, and I see people doing it all the time, and they do, do great on it. So what I do is, see that, I pull my wings the wings right here way back and I can use it as a shear scraper right down the side. I can do a shearing cut with those and then I can also come in and, and uh, use it the tip of it for a bowl couch. I just I'm more comfortable with that and I don't seem to get hardly any catches. Yes? How do you sharpen a curved hollow tool? A curved hollow? Curved hollowing tool. I don't know what a curved hollowing tool is. What is that? Oh, oh, I don't have any of those. Um, I, you know what, I've seen those. Um, he's talking about, have you guys ever seen the, the tool that comes out and it has a has a loop in it? I, th I think that's what he's talking. Uh, somebody asked another question. I don't, I don't know what that is. No. I mean, I, I know what they are. I mean, I don't know how to sharpen them. I don't have any. All right. Any other questions about sharpening? Do you also try to sharpen your carbide tips? No. I No. Um, I've heard of people using the diamond stones to sharpen them, but um, I don't know. They, they I've had this one right here. Actually, for three years, maybe a little bit longer, and it was getting so so dull. Um, or actually, wasn't it wasn't getting that dull, but it was it was getting down there. I mean, I've had the thing for three years. I keep turning it around to when I use it, but I use this on to cut the um, the stone, the alabaster with. After I've had it for three years, and it. it, it if you watch the video, it, it still cut that fine. So it still feels pretty sharp, but I, I don't know what they recommend if you're if you want to sharpen carbide. And I don't even know if the diamond stone will actually, if it does it. It's only the tips are cheap anyway. And what? The the tips are cheap anyway to buy. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, and it lasts you three years. So. <laughs> it's, yeah. So I mean, you, you throw them away and, and grab a new one. I think. I think it's just easier to mess with it. Um, if the diamond stone did work, you, you have to get that that grind or that bevel right on them too, and maybe make a jig or something for it. But yeah, I just I've never never mess with that. But it, and it's still you know what I cut cut that alabaster with it, and I still I cut something wood afterwards, and I was just like impressed that it was still making little shavings out of it. Um, uh, that is, ooh. all right, any, anything else? We've got a couple minutes left, it looks like. Mm. <laughs> Nothing? All right. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, the next live show is going to be next month, and I'm going to make a duck call. I had a a lot of requests to uh, make that and show everybody the pin chuck and how all that, that works. And uh, so I think that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to try and stick to, you know, quick little projects that uh, uh, don't take very long. So maybe we'll get, get some more questions on that. But uh, anything else before we take off here? I just want to say thank you for doing this because 
I think we are learning a lot. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks. And uh, yeah, I'll pr probably I'm gonna just start off, you know, doing doing simple stuff, and then maybe maybe work up to doing doing longer things. But I I wasn't sure how many questions would would be coming in, so I didn't want to tackle a bowl or box right off the bat. All right. Um, I will repost this, I guess, and uh, see if we get any more comments and, and uh, any more questions. All right. Um, thank you all for coming and watching, and I will do another one next month. All right. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Nick. I'm just going to go off air here real quick.